You notice that was quicker, too. So we had just spent a, a while talking about cardiac function in the context of how the heart's internal mechanisms are supplied and how they work. We looked at the structure and changes in structure of some of the coronary arteries and how that might compromise cardiac function, uh, compromise the ability of the heart to work normally. But what we haven't done yet is looked at what the heart working normally is. The heart working normally, its job is to be a pump. So we left with this concept of flow, and flow is the job of the heart. The um, coronary blockages and narrowing that we talked about would impact the heart's ability to create flow, to create cue throughout the rest of the body. And so we're looking at now what it means for there to be flow, movement of blood through a system of tubes. That's the job the heart is supposed to accomplish, and it does so minute after minute, day after day, for 80, 85 years or so, depending on your genes, depending on your lifestyle, etc. So the heart does a really good job of maintaining its role as a pump, and we want to understand how, um, how flow works, what flow is, and how we can measure flow. Because our job in labs four and five is to measure flow. And we're going to affect some variables that will change flow, and then we will measure that change in flow. What is flow? The movement of, uh, of blood through a system of tubes. I'm taking a physical approach to describe flow here. There are characteristics of the arterial system that will dictate uh, the ability of the heart to maintain flow. If there's lots of resistance, flow will go down. If there's a big pressure gradient, flow will go up. So these are physical characteristics that impact flow. And you can measure this anywhere. You could measure this in the brachial artery or uh, across a capillary bed. You can measure it in the venous side of the, uh, the vascular system. Wherever you measure it, how localized you want the measure to be, these values also have to be localized. You need an accurate number of viscosity at that specific point. You need the radius at that specific point. You need pressure before and after that specific point. You get the gradient. And the more localized you try to make this measurement, the harder it is more invasive it is, the more you have to zoom in and you're limited technically by your skills as an investigator or by the technology you have on hand. So we're not going to do this locally. We are going to do this systemically. We are going to consider the entire vascular system as an average pressure gradient with an average length and an average diameter or radius more specifically. And if we do that, we can figure out what the average flow is. That in and of itself can give us some pretty useful information. So leaving these physical characteristics behind, or starting to leave these physical characteristics behind, I want to distill them from pi, radius, viscosity, length of a tube, to a more easy to digest form, or into a more easy to digest form. What this equation says is simply that flow will occur as a result of pressure difference and against a resistance. Flow is pressure divided by resistance. That is, flow is proportional to a pressure gradient and it is inversely proportional to resistance. And that makes sense. If you have pressure, you can assume that blood will move or a liquid will move. There will be flow. If you have resistance, its name describes what happens. It resists the movement of fluid. Flow will go down. So flow is equal to pressure 
over resistance. Now, all I've done in this first instance is separated out the pressure factor from that last equation. We're left with pressure, which is easy to understand, and then a bunch of other stuff. Since these two are multiplied, the last bit of detail that I'm going to show you before we pull back and consider resistance just as one concept, this stuff that's other than pressure is what we would call a resistance term. If you wanted to assess total resistance of the vasculature, it would be combined, the length of that system the viscosities of all the different bloods at all the points in that system, the different radii of that system, all those things averaged and combined together collectively gives us a value for resistance. We're not ever going to calculate resistance, so you don't have to worry about that. I'm just showing you how we move from the Poissoy equation, which is nice and detailed with physical characteristics, to some that's a bit more user-friendly that we in the exercise physiology realm can, can work with, can deal with. Flow we can deal with, liters per minute, mils per minute, no problem. Pressure we can deal with, millimeters of mercury or PSI or something like that, but um, resistance is difficult. There's a lot of factors that go into it. We're just going to use this as a uh, we're, our understanding is going to be that whatever the number is, a higher resistance would oppose flow. So, flow is pressure divided by resistance. We, like I mentioned in my preamble, and maybe I shouldn't have given away the, uh, the, the ending, the summary, the conclusion too quickly, but... Wherever we are in the vascular system, size changes, thickness of the arteries change, the viscosity changes, turbulence changes, and therefore flow is affected. Resistance changes at many points too. The radii are different, the length is different, but we can't measure those things, so we call it total peripheral resistance. Our focus is really only at the whole body level. If the heart is working and we want to assess the heart's function, we need to know its flow output and what it's working against. And total peripheral resistance is what the heart is working against. The heart we think of as being a pump and giving out a certain flow rate. And on average, that's true. You think of liters of blood per minute or mils of blood per minute. There is an average value that the heart will pump out over time. But the heart isn't always constantly active. The heart will pump, it relaxes. It pumps, it relaxes. And with every beat, blood is pushed out. With every uh, relaxation between beats, there's no active infusion of blood into that system. So... Like resistance will be averaged, flow will be averaged as well. With every beat, pressure rises and then falls, rises and then falls. Pressure is one of the things that dictates whether flow occurs or not. And so with every beat, flow will rise and fall, rise and fall. That's overly detailed. But I want to acknowledge that before we leave um, each beat behind and start talking about the average. Average flow rate is a result of average pressure and opposed by average or total resistance. And this gives rise to one of the fundamental physiological equations that you've undoubtedly heard before, seen before. Cardiac output is a function of mean arterial pressure divided by total peripheral resistance. This is simply born out of the Poissoy equation describing the physical flow in a tube. This is average flow, average pressure, and average resistance, and we don't care about the radius and the length and the viscosity. We're boiling these down to one dimensionless big resistance term. But this is something that you've seen before. 
probably, in x-rays, right? Some head nods. You've seen it. Whether you remember it or not is a different issue, but we'll get back to it in detail in this class. Cardiac output is a function of mean arterial pressure and total peripheral resistance. In lab, you're going to calculate this. You can also maybe jump ahead and think, well, we've also talked about mean arterial pressure before. I seem to remember there being an equation to figure that out. <coughs> if we have two parts of a three-term equation, it's possible to solve for the unknown afterwards. We've never seen total peripheral resistance before. But if we have flow and we have mean arterial pressure, we can figure out what it is. It's part of the, uh, the point of lab's formula. So how would we ever assess flow? How would we ever assess flow? I made mention last class about uh, being able to determine flow or approximate flow through imaging techniques. And these are a series of images from the, uh, the nuclear stress test where, remember, we measured the presence of a marker in the heart tissue and this was a result of blood flow and delivery of that marker to the cardiac tissue. And you can see there's many different angles, short, vertical, horizontal axes, to show the delivery of blood at different points in time. And you can see as you move from left to right that the delivery of that marker in the blood will change. It gets brighter across this middle portion. It gets less bright across the bottom portion. That simply highlights the the changes in local blood flow. <coughs> local blood flow doesn't help us calculate the, the pumping action of the heart. What we can garner from these images is the space in between also changes. Right? If the marker is being delivered to the heart tissue, and this is a healthy heart, then the space in between is probably the inside of the heart, the ventricle in this case, the atria in the uh, case at the top, the inside of the heart changes in shape with every beat. And if we assume that the inside compartments will fill up normally and then blood will be expelled with every beat, if we can monitor the change in the chamber size of the heart, we can figure out how much is being expelled. We can estimate cardiac output by changes in the ventricular lumen volume. The lumen is the space within the ventricle. If it opens up and we can figure out so many centimeters cubed of volume within that space and then it closes or it's compressed during contraction and we can figure out how many milliliters or centimeters cubed of space there is then, the difference between those two, good morning, will be how much was expelled. If we know how many times blood is expelled in a given minute or hour, we can figure out the total volume per minute or flow. This is involved. It takes um, a fair bit of computational power. These are all static images over time. And you have to integrate all of these images together to figure out how it opens and compresses, how the chamber gets larger and smaller. There's a lot of calculus involved in, in computation. It's not easy to do this on our own. Plus, it's static. What if we're missing something between pictures? What we can do instead is use an echocardiogram that uses sound waves to monitor in real time the uh, changes in the tissues of the heart. Non-invasive, relatively uh, accessible, inexpensive on the order of a few thousand dollars for a machine that will, um, will measure or will provide you with an echocardiogram. We'll see that in a video that's coming up shortly. Uh, the sound waves will pass through more easily in places where there's no tissue impeding their, uh, their travel. In places where there are tissue, you get a reading, the sound waves bounce back, they're received by a receptor, and then it creates a map or an image of the heart. And this is usually done in real time. The sound waves bounce back continuously. And even though I'm showing you a static image here, the readout on the screen 
but you move it and in real time. And so you get a nice continuous comprehensive image of how the chamber opens, not closes, but expands and contracts, expands and contracts. How it fills during diastole and empties during systole. Diastole is the resting period of the heart, and systole is when the heart contracts. And the difference between those two, the difference between end diastolic volume and end systolic volume, yeah, the volume after the resting period and the volume after the heart contracts and expels blood, the difference between those two things is the stroke volume, how much is expelled. As a percentage of how much was there to begin with, this equation is showing you what's called the ejection fraction. You might expel 80% of the ventricular volume with every beat. 75%, 85%, never 100%. There's always some left over. And this is really easy. I'd love to be able to get one of these for us to have in lab. We just don't have the, uh, the readily available funds for labs to be able to do that. But machines like this will allow you to figure out a pretty accurate uh, representation of stroke volume, ejection fraction, and then use that over time to calculate cardiac output. And not only that, but well, we see another, uh, another use of the echocardiogram here. Changes in the thickness of some of the structures of the heart can perhaps indicate some amyloid deposits or plaque deposits. Typically uh, an area where measurement is quite difficult. Getting samples or assessing the structure of the inside of the heart is generally quite sensitive, difficult, and disruptive. But if you can do that with a, an assessment from outside the body using sound waves, perhaps identification of these plaques could allow this individual to receive the proper therapy before it becomes a problem. You could do this with um, the arteries as well throughout the body. That's certainly one really nice aspect of the echocardiogram. But as this technology advances, not only do we get images of how the heart's configuration changes throughout the cardiac cycle, but we can also get more detailed information about blood flow. The blood will also disrupt those sound waves that are being delivered. And how blood is moving within the ventricles, whether it's away from the monitor or towards it, can be sensed. So. In this representation, you still have the structure of the heart in black and white. And then the colored portion, the machine figures out, is blood. It's moving in relation to these otherwise fixed structures of the heart. It's moving in such a way that it can register it coming towards the monitor. The, uh, the red to yellow um, color scale values are blood moving towards the monitor. The monitor is at the, the most superficial anterior portion of the chest. It's blood in the heart that's heading towards the monitor, towards the front of my body. And then the dark blue towards white on the bottom axis is um, blood moving away. So you get a sense of the, the movement and the churning of blood in these chambers as well. Some blood is moving towards, some blood is moving away as the heart contracts and then expels blood to the rest of the body. This is much more detail than we are going to uh, look at in lab. Much more detail than we concern ourselves with at this point in a fourth year upper level undergrad course. This is detail that you'd see in med school. Extra detail about the inner workings of the heart and not just the job of the heart to function as a pump. But I want to show you briefly what this looks like in real time. Because you can hear me tell you about the, the uh, real continuous nature of these echocardiograms, but so far I've only shown you static pictures. 
and you've only seen static colors. They're not changing. So I want to show you in what is one of my favorite videos of the course, how the echocardiogram works. Favorite videos of the course because Dr. Bob does such a great job of describing its normal function. This is a very common procedure. It's an ultrasound test. So the person comes in, they lie on their side, and we take a microphone, it's an ultrasound transducer, on the chest wall. It brings sound waves through and through the heart, and we make images. So what kind of images are we looking for? Can you see a heart valve? Yes, so we see all four heart valves, the heart muscle, the sac around the heart, the aorta, all the chambers of the heart, the four chambers. Do, do you see the heart muscle move? Can you see it contract a little bit? We do, and we can calculate the volume and the pumping function, the ejection fraction. Is that one of the most important things that you get out of it, the ejection fraction, to see how strong that heart is beating? Yes, very, very important. Can you tell if there's a weak valve, a leaky valve, or a, a valve that's not letting blood go through, a stenotic? That's right. We can, we can see both. We can determine how severe, so it could be mild, moderate, or severe amount of stenosis or regurgitation, sticky valve or leaky valve. Can we take a look at the echocardiogram? Sure. Malcolm, this is a real echocardiogram. Now, tell me what you're seeing here. I see some black areas and some white areas. So tell me what part of the heart this is. Let me start with the pumping chamber of the heart, the left ventricle. So this is the pumping chamber. The ventricle is normal in size. This is the heart muscle of normal thickness. The pumping function of the heart is normal. Then this is the mitral valve where it allows blood flow into the left ventricle. This is the aortic valve where the blood flow ejects from the heart into the aorta. Now, can you tell if that aortic valve is leaking by just looking at this? Well, we can. So we would see if this valve were thickened and narrowed and did not open properly, that would be stenosis. And we apply color across there to see if there's any leakage of blood flow, backflow. And he does not have either. Now, could you just walk down and do this in the abdomen and the legs and everything else? We can. We can do ultrasound of all the blood vessels, believe it or not, even from within the brain, the neck, the heart, the kidneys, down the legs. Now, Malcolm, this is a very expensive machine right here. What are the chances that we could have this in every exam in the room and come in just to see your regular? What's available? Well, it's actually available now. So there is a handheld device. It's about the size of a smartphone. And then the probe, which is attached by a cable, allows us to take the very same pictures, the very same images as an expensive unit that we have in the hospital. So in the examining room, I could run this over my heart, and I could look at the valves on the smartphone. That's right. So compared to a stethoscope, for example, we get much more information, a much more detailed look at the heart with a handheld ultrasound. Malcolm Buster, this is great. Thank you. It's been exciting for me. Thank you so much, Dr. Bob. He's uh, ever the quizzical one, Dr. Bob. Meanwhile, the patient's thinking, like, this is my life now. These guys are going to tell me that my heart's not working. Luckily, he's, he's all good. But... Um, yeah, so you see the power of the uh, echocardiogram, which would be really nice to have in lab, but at least from that point of view, that video, you can get a sense of, uh, of how it works. We are going back in time, though. We are using some somewhat more antiquated methods for determining cardiac output, and not even um, one step back, maybe, maybe two or three steps back. There have been a number of methods and innovations in determining cardiac output over the years. And these, uh, these first two were advances when I was in uh, graduate school, and the last two are the fundamental ways to look at them. And we're looking at one of the fundamental ways in lab. So what I'm calling the quote-unquote old methods for determining Q or determining cardiac output worked based on the premise that if you inject something that's not normally found in the vasculature, 
and measured how quickly it was washed away, that could give you information about flow. And that makes sense, right? If you put something in that you can measure and it disappears quickly, it's washed away quickly, flow is probably quick. And the opposite is true. If you put something in that you can measure and then it's not washed away quickly, flow is probably slow. And one of those things was uh, a dye isotope, uh, endocyanin and green, which wasn't absorbed very easily and some other various types of dye that you could measure uh, after injecting, you'd inject it on the venous side, it would go through the heart, you would measure it on the arterial side, you take various blood samples at, um, at uh, multiple points and then create this curve showing the appearance and the disappearance of the dye. So dye enters, it circulates, and then uh, after the heart, you register how much of that dye is present in the, excuse me, in the blood sample how much it mixed together, how much it was washed away. And if this peak was really tall, that tended to say, well, the, the dye stayed together in the bolus when it was administered. It wasn't stretched, it didn't wash away, it wasn't mixed with all the blood that it rushed by. It stayed in one general sample, and you can see this really high peak that uh, abates or washes away rather quickly. It's a peak because it, it stayed relatively intact as it uh, traveled through the vascular system. And so depending on the size of this peak, that could tell you something about cardiac output. You're only measuring dye concentration, but there would be formulas to say, well, the rate of the increase of the slope and the peak would give this value for cardiac output. And you'd have to make a very quick measurement because blood is continually traveling in a circuit and um, the dye would gradually mix with the rest of the blood. It's not absorbed, and so you'd see it come back around again as that blood traveled around through the heart again and then back to the sampling site. And that would go on and on until it was mixed uniformly and then dealt with or excreted. Dye is one physical measurement that you can make that would result in this kind of trace. Temperature is also a physical measurement that would result in this kind of trace. Not in the sense that you can pick it out of the blood and point to it and analyze it and say, there's a molecule here. But insofar as if you inject a really cold shot of saline, if it warmed up really quickly, if it was washed away quickly by the blood and it warmed up quickly, you could say flow was quick. If that really cold bolus stuck together and made uh, temperature drop sharply and then come back up as it passed by, well, flow is probably quite slow. It would be a very similar graph to what the dye concentration graph shows here, but just flipped, with temperature dropping as the cold saline passes by and then rising back up again. And the benefit of something like that is that there's no foreign molecules being injected into your body. It's just saline. It will warm to your body's temperature, and then the saline will be distributed throughout the body, and then if there's an excess, you'll pee it out. A very similar premise, measuring the introduction of some foreign substance or a foreign state of a native substance, and then figuring out how quickly it washed away. Even those are difficult to do in lab. We can't run arterial catheters, for instance. We can't run venous catheters because there's a couple of ethical issues. Arterial catheters, really tricky. Whenever you've gone to the, uh, the doctor and you've gotten a needle, it's always been a venous catheter. It's always been a venous blood sample in the uh, antibrachial fossa, one of, the, uh, one of the, uh, the veins in the upper arm. And then really nice dark red blood flows out into the tube. If you do that on the arterial side, the pressure difference is so large, you have to be careful that the sampling tube doesn't shoot off. Or if you have a syringe that you attach to draw a sample out, you don't even need to pull the plunger. It just pushes the plunger out for you. The pressure is so high. So we're not doing that in lab. There's some dangers associated with that. Not to mention that our arteries are really hard to access and you have to be really well practiced to hit them properly and not cause some, some damage. So what we're going to do instead 
is try to find a non-invasive measure or a whole body measure that allows us to assess flow. The original method that we're going to look at um, shortly was the direct Fick method by Adolf Fick, the same guy that uh, pioneered the Fick equation in the lungs that we've already seen in the, uh, the lung function of respirometry section. We see a couple familiar terms here. VO2 is equal to cardiac output times the AVO2 difference, the difference in oxygen between the arterial and venous blood. That's what that value says. The difference in oxygen between the arterial and venous blood. And so in the context of things being washed away, this is, this is in line with that understanding, right? There's more oxygen in the arterial blood it's extracted so that there's less in the venous blood, and then the, the amount of that difference, the, the size of that difference, will be influenced by how quickly blood is moving, and we can measure the rate of oxygen extraction at the whole body level at the mouth. It's not immediately clear how all those things link up, but a big focus of the next few slides is to, to understand this equation. Even this is really invasive, though, and we'll see why. So what we're going to do is look at the indirect Fick equation. And I'm not putting the equation up here to confuse you or to avoid confusing you. But we're going to look at the development of the direct Fick and then the modification that is the indirect Fick that allows us to make the measurement in lab in a somewhat non-invasive and safe way. Somewhat safe way. So let's take a look at the Fick principle. And the Fick principle underlies the principle of dilution or thermodilution. The Fick principle is that which describes the measurement of flow. And um, being a prolific physiologist, Adolf Fick wasn't happy after 1855 defining the laws of diffusion, so he turned his attention to cardiac output, um, described cardiac output, and published the relationship in 1901. 45 years of work, which is, sounds like a really long time. Um, we'll look at the equation proper. The equation that we looked at was on the last slide, but you can boil that down to, or write it in words as, delivery rate is equal to flow rate times concentration. Delivery of a substance is how quickly the substance is moving and how much of that substance there is. So in general terms, on two extremes, the delivery in a situation where flow was really quick, but you didn't have very much of it, could be the same as a situation where flow was really slow, but you had massive amounts of whatever that substance was. Delivery in those two extremes might be similar. Delivery is flow rate multiplied by concentration. VO2 is cardiac output times the AVO2 difference. Let's try to understand how this works. Let's get a visceral understanding of delivery being a function of flow rate times concentration. I really like, it's difficult to find a good example that, uh, that describes this function, but I like using um, one example that maybe you've heard of before or not. But you've seen, if you haven't seen one in real life, you've seen those sushi conveyor belts. Where if you're at a sushi restaurant, there's a conveyor belt that sits, uh, that's in front of you. If you sit at the bar and you can take plates off and then eat sushi and put your used plates back on. I'm going to use that as my example for describing delivery as flow rate by concentration. We don't have any here, surprisingly enough, in a small town. But uh, the sushi conveyor belt is a great example. And let me just jump ahead. I meant to bring this picture up, but this is what I mean. The sushi conveyor belt, if you haven't seen one before, is literally just like uh, one of the conveyor belts that your luggage comes out on at the airport. And actually, that's probably a good, uh, a good example as well. But that your luggage comes uh, out on at the airport, and then you're sitting in front of it waiting for your luggage or waiting for your sushi to, sushi to show up, and uh, the kind that you want, and then you pick it out when you see it. So in this first 
overall example, let's imagine that the conveyor belt's linear. Your job is that you have to eat all of the sushi. It goes from the kitchen straight at you, and you have to take all the plates off. All right? Some people dream about that situation. If the conveyor belt moves at one meter per minute, and let's say you have three sushis per meter, that's a lot of sushi. You're going to be full quickly. The rate of delivery is three sushis per minute. And this parallels the equation that, uh, that Adolf Fick described. He never thought his equation would be used in such a manner. But delivery is flow times concentration. Flow is how quickly the medium is moving. The concentration is how many things per section or per, per unit volume do you have. Those two elements combined give you delivery of a substance. In this case, you are tasked with dealing with three sushis per minute or three plates of sushi per minute. You have to shovel that away and try not to get too bloated. Which if you've been to an all-you-can-eat sushi buffet, you know it's, it's like a precipice. There's like, uh, you're fine for a while and then bam, incredibly full. So be careful. So it's a simple and somewhat foolish example, but I think it gets the premise across quite nicely. The delivery rate is a, co a combined factor that um, depends on how quickly the stuff is moving and how much of the stuff there is. Now this assumes that it's a linear conveyor belt, right? No one's ever going to set up at the end of a conveyor belt from the kitchen and eat all the sushi. What is more likely is that there's sushi passing in front of you and you get to pick and choose. You don't have to eat all of it. You can take some and then leave some as it passes by in front. Delivery in the body is not indicative of usage. And this is what I'm describing, the difference between delivery and usage. Just because you send a substance through the bloodstream, through the arteries, to the muscle, or whatever tissue, does not mean it will be taken up. So to add a little bit to Adolf Fick's equation, what if you don't eat all of the sushi? What if you're full? Instead of delivery being a function of flow rate times concentration, if we modify this slightly, instead of just assuming everything is disposed of and we only need to measure concentration once, now what I want to do is measure concentration that's incoming and concentration that's outgoing, the difference in concentration. The difference would have been how much I've removed, how many sushi plates have I taken off as a customer at the sushi bar. What is the net uptake in this situation? Well, I'm starting to get full. The sushi uh, conveyor belt is still moving at one meter per minute, but the change in concentration is, is different. I'm not eating three sushis per meter, one of them I'm leaving to pass on to the next person. I'm being generous. No one wants to be the person that doesn't pass on any sushi to the other people at the bar. So all of a sudden, the uptake is two sushis per minute. Notice, in this case, delivery is the exact same. Can you see how delivery would be the exact same? The conveyor belt moves at the same speed. The incoming concentration is the same but you're leaving some to pass on to the next person. Delivery is the exact same, but your extraction, the uptake, or the consumption of sushi in this case is lower. You elected to eat less than what was delivered to you. And this very simple premise can be applied to muscle in the body with oxygen as it's sushi plate with the oxygen that it consumes. Net uptake in the body of oxygen is equal to the flow rate of blood carrying oxygen and then the change in concentration between the arterial and venous oxygen contents. Net uptake it's VO2, right? VO2, the definition of which you've learned in X-Phys is the rate that oxygen is consumed at the whole body level. 
the net uptake of oxygen at the whole body level is equal to flow rate of oxygen through the blood on that conveyor belt system throughout the body, and then the change in concentration. How much delivery does the tissue see? How much is extracted? And then what passes on to be recirculated back to the heart? So just notice for a second where this didn't make immediate sense when we saw it three slides ago. After that sushi example, you're like, you're pros at it. Of course. Of course, you're a pro. You'll check the video after. So VO2 is cardiac output times the AVO2 difference. That's what I'm describing here. This blood vessel is the conveyor belt. There's some oxygen coming in on the arterial side, more than what's leaving on the venous side because the muscle has extracted some. So let's take a look at how that works and what the significance is. If we can figure out or solve this equation, and for our purposes, we want to solve flow rate, what does that allow us to do? We've already seen one of these equations today. I've listed two fundamental physiological equations on this slide. We've seen the top one in a slightly different form. Remember, flow was equal to pressure, and it was inversely proportional to resistance. So I've, I've rewritten it a little bit differently here because in the body, you could argue, and it's not the point of this class, you'd argue that the most important variable is pressure Pressure is the regulated variable, and you need to maintain pressure to make sure that there's movement of blood within the body. Regardless, it's the same equation in a slightly different manner. Well, you've seen these before, and some of these variables are quite easy to measure, some more than others. Mean arterial pressure, fairly easy. You've practiced with the blood pressure cuffs. There's the automated blood pressure cuff in lab as well that maybe you've used, maybe not. It's pretty easy to get blood pressure if you're practiced and you know the procedure. It's also dead easy to get heart rate. Manually, super easy. With a heart rate monitor, even easier. If we're somehow able to figure out flow, now according to these more complicated equations, we can get values that we've never had access to before. We can get a sense of what total peripheral resistance is which tells us arguably some important information about the body, but we won't know until we measure it and see how it changes. And stroke volume, that's a pretty cool thing to be able to measure. Stroke volume, the amount of blood that's ejected from the heart with each beat. Because cardiac output is a function of heart rate and stroke volume, how frequently the heart pumps and how much it pumps. If we know cardiac output and heart rate, stroke volume can be solved for or determined. Never before have you been able to walk away from a lab saying, oh, my stroke volume at 100 watts during exercise was 110 mils per beat. That's kind of cool. And then in lab five, when you're dehydrated or your subject is, you get to see if that changes. Is it going to go down? Does the body defend it? Is it defended by changing pressure or resistance? We're going to find out. Knowing Q, we can calculate stroke volume and total peripheral resistance. That's nothing new. So um, let's graphically explore this concept. We went from Adolf Fick's equation in words to understanding the idea of delivery and how the equation described delivery to how the equation described uptake. So it's a stepwise increase in complexity. Remember, here it is again in words. Delivery rate is flow rate times concentration. And in this example, scenario one, I have some modest flow rate. The concentration here is five oxygens per minute. And in scenario two, faster flow rate, same concentration, theoretically the delivery would be faster, right? If I only change one of these elements, in this case I'm changing flow rate, making it faster, if the concentration is the same, 
five oxygens per minute, whatever that means, then delivery would be increased. Delivery is not a, it's, it's somewhat physiologically useful, but for our ability to calculate cardiac output, we need to imagine there's something in the way. We need to imagine the muscle is extracting oxygen from the sample. This is much more physiologically relevant. So in this situation, instead of measuring total delivery, it's still five oxygens per minute at a given flow rate. Now, I've got a muscle that's active, that's extracting oxygen as it travels through the blood to the venous system. So instead of five oxygens per minute, let's say each dot is 100 mils. There's five dots that move through. It's hard to tell that. You have to take my word for it. But there are five dots that move through. So 500 mils of oxygen per liter. If I'm extracting one of those dots, I'm left with 400 mils of oxygen per liter on the venous side. Now I need to know how quickly this blood is traveling in order to calculate cardiac output. In my example, I'm going to use a nice round number of one liter per minute, and this allows me to calculate um, cardiac output, or this allows me to calculate the extraction according to the Fick equation, which would be to substitute these numbers in. Notice in this case, I am giving cardiac output, and we are figuring out the rate of, it, of whole body extraction, VO2 in this case. VO2 is cardiac output times the difference in arterial versus venous O2. I'm taking out 100 mils of blood. It's traveling at 1 liter per minute. Therefore, VO2 is 100 mils of oxygen per minute. You could sub those numbers right into this equation. We're solving for VO2 in this case. I think that's pretty straightforward. Imagine how you would solve for Q. If I didn't give you one liter per minute, you would need to have a VO2 value to be able to solve for Q. Good news is, it's pretty easy to get a VO2 value. Is it easy to get arterial and venous O2 contents? That's another story. VO2 is easily measured. Can we measure arterial and venous O2 contents? Let's explore this idea. I want to measure cardiac output at the whole body level. And I need to measure cardiac output at the whole body level because the VO2 value that I get from the metabolic cart, the way that we know to e easily calculate VO2, is also at the whole body level. These things have to be at the same level in order for the calculation to work. So I need arterial oxygen at the whole body level and venous oxygen at the whole body level. Hmm. I'm going to rewrite the equation slightly differently. It's the exact same as, as it was before, except I'm separating arterial O2 from venous O2. The AVO2 difference, A minus V, is exactly what I'm showing you here. AVO2 difference. Where would each of these values come from? Well, VO2 is fairly straightforward. Measure it at the whole body by doing a whole body gas collection. The machine does some magic. We get VO2 in liters per minute. If the machine didn't do its magic, you'd probably still be able to calculate VO2, right? You can measure the O2 contents in the expired gas, measure ventilation, sure. But let's rely on the machine for right now. We'll get a VO2 value in liters per minute. Where, now we're, we're trying to figure out Q, so the other two values we need to get. Let's start with the next one, arterial O2. Where would you get a value for arterial oxygen? Let's say that you have an analyzer that can figure it out. We don't need to know how to measure it, but we need the location where arterial oxygen is representative of whole body arterial oxygen. Where would you get it? Aorta. Aorta. Okay. Anywhere else? 
probably the best answer. It's not the only answer, though. But where else might you get an arterial sample that gives you the whole body arterial oxygen content? What about um, what about the left ventricle? Would that work before it's pumped out to the rest of the body? Okay. Left ventricle, aorta. What about the left carotid artery? Same thing or, or different? <coughs> Maybe that would work. What about like femoral artery? Would that work too? Maybe? Yeah, it would. The heart mixes the blood. It's uniformly distributed. It's completely oxygenated. You sample any arterial blood, and you get whole body oxygen. Right? It's pumped from the heart into the arteries. The arteries transmit the blood to an active tissue. Then it's modified. But up until that point, you can sample anywhere in the arterial system and you get the same value for arterial oxygen. You get the same value for arterial glucose, arterial epinephrine. The arterial blood is uniform, it's mixed. So we just need access to an artery. We can jump right into the aorta if we want. I don't know many people that would volunteer for that though. Any artery, uh, certainly the aorta is the, the uh, First point of access um, from blood leaving the heart. Okay, so there's a red flag, right? We want to calculate cardiac output using the direct FIC equation. VO2 is easy, but now I'm putting needles into arteries. That's not great. It's not impossible, but it's not great. Here's the... I think that you actually have the picture that I'm asking you about on the next slide, but... Here's the rub. This is where it gets impossible, or near impossible, at least for student class. <coughs> where do we get venous oxygen? Arterial oxygen, we can sample any artery. Venous oxygen, can we sample any vein? No. That's correct. You did shake your head no, right? Yes. Why did you say no? Absolutely correct. Different tissues have different metabolic rates. They will extract different amounts of oxygen. Just imagine if you are out for a run or you're in the lab doing a, a bike ride. Your leg muscles, quadriceps, knee extensors, they're using a lot of oxygen. Those are primarily active. Your biceps aren't active. So you measure oxygen in the femoral vein versus, say, one of the cephalic veins going to be very different. Where can you figure out or get a measure of whole body venous oxygen? Vena cava. Actually not correct. That's a great, that's a great uh, guess though. That is the, it's near the end of the venous system. So you've had the chance for most of uh, the veins to merge and combine and for blood to mix. And that's the second best answer. And it gets uh, to the idea of you don't want to measure far away near one active tissue. You want to combine the venous blood draining as many active tissues as possible. So vena cava, you have superior and inferior, right? Superior drains the head and upper limbs, inferior drains the lower body and abdomen. Where is the only point, or one of the only points in the body where all the venous blood is mixed? Right atrium, or right ventricle, or pulmonary trunk. All of a sudden, you're inserting a catheter and sampling from the right atrium. If you wanna get uniform, whole body, mixed oxygen, the right atrium is the first place that you can do it, the least invasive place that you can sample. 
Any volunteers? No, probably not. Into the right atrium. And admittedly, sure, you can do it. Um, you could do it just like you uh, administered the catheter for the angiogram. Remember, they went in through the femoral artery all the way up through the heart. You could go in through the femoral vein all the way up through the inferior vena cava if you wanted. You can go in through um, one of the, the veins in the arm like you would at the doctor's office and then snake a catheter all the way up. But still, I don't really want to exercise with a catheter sampling blood from my right atrium. This is invasive. It's really unfortunate that it's invasive because it's a pretty cool uh, concept, right? If we understand the equation, now we can figure out where we would get all the values to satisfy that equation. We could calculate cardiac output. There must be some other way. Obviously, if there are two labs devoted to calculating cardiac output, there must be some other way. What other substance is like oxygen in the body but not? That has an uptake or a rate of production that would be subject to flow, that would have arterial and venous values that we don't know yet, but we'll see if we can measure them. What substance is like oxygen that would, but it's not oxygen, that we have in the body that we could measure? Sodium. Actually, that's interesting. Sodium. Sodium. Okay, the reason that sodium won't work is that there's no, there's no change in concentration between the arterial and the venous side, sodium is mixed. And there is perhaps a difference across the kidneys as you filter some out, but that raises a whole host of other concerns for sampling, getting into the kidneys and or measuring urine sodium, which we could possibly do. Interesting though. It would move in the arteries, but there's no, there's no quick and easy production or uptake of sodium that we can measure in two different places to figure out how quickly the blood must have moved. It would take a lot longer for sodium to change in the body because it's uh, mostly subject to hormonal regulation of the kidneys. So it takes like days to weeks to change sodium. That's a really interesting perspective though. Not sodium, because we want to do something uh, slightly more user-friendly and quicker. CO2, absolutely. It's like oxygen, but it's not. There is a production of CO2 in the body. It moves in the blood, and it moves quickly. There are differences in concentration. CO2, how would that work graphically? Instead of oxygen being white, CO2 is the evil twin. CO2 molecules are black in this example. So you've got arterial CO2 moving through the body, and the system is slightly different. It's inverse. It's the negative of oxygen consumption, right? CO2 is produced in the body. That's a byproduct of metabolism. So we've got flow, we've got concentration on one side, and concentration on the other side that is influenced by production of CO2 at the muscle. In this case, it's very similar. We can still calculate according to the Fick equation. We have five CO2 molecules, and if each one is, is 100 mils of a uh, that gas per liter, we've got 500 mils of CO2 per liter on the arterial side. On the venous side, we are adding CO2 to the system. We have 600 mils of CO2 on the venous side. In this example, it's still moving at one liter per minute, and so I could solve for the rate of CO2 production at the whole body level using the Fick equation. I'm gonna change it slightly. VCO2 instead of VO2 is flow rate times the arterial venous CO2 difference. One important distinction here is that the order of the arterial and venous values are, are reversed. That's only because if you don't reverse them, negative numbers come into play and people don't like negative numbers when you're working with equations. The, the negative symbol only 
gives you information about the direction. All right? So if a positive number is oxygen consumption, a negative number means it's moving in the opposite direction, it's being produced. That's the only difference. But to avoid that confusion, I'm reversing this so that Venus is always, uh, it always contains more CO2 than arterial. The difference then will always be positive. We'll always get a positive number for VCO2 and or cardiac output, depending on how we solve it. So this looks very similar to the last slide, and it should make as much sense as the last slide that we looked at. We're depositing a certain amount. We can measure CO2 contents on the arterial and venous sides, measure cardiac output, calculate VCO2. But we're not calculating VCO2. We can easily measure VCO2, just like we measure VO2. It happens at the same time. It's a column on the metabolic cart you'll often ignore because we don't really use it except to calculate RER. And even that's given on its own. So you overlook VCO2. VCO2 is easily calculated. We want to get cardiac output. Is there ever a way that we could measure venous and arterial CO2 contents? So I'm going to break those apart like we did on the last slide. And we'll discuss how we would measure each of those. We'll, we'll theorize about how we would measure each of those, and then we'll call it the day. VCO2, no surprise. Whole body CO2 production measured at the mouth, uh, calculated and analyzed by the metabolic cart. We get a number for rest. We get a number for light, moderate, intense exercise. Good. Easy to get that. For venous and arterial CO2 contents, I'm going to zoom in at the interface in the lungs between the blood and the air. Because we're measuring air at the whole body level, and we want to try to figure out if it can be used as a proxy or a surrogate for venous CO2 measures. If you were measuring directly from the blood, you could measure CO2 in the aorta or any artery, or measure CO2 in the right atrium, like we did on the last slide. That would be fairly invasive. But is there possibly a way that blood on the arterial and venous sides could be approximated or interpreted with the air that leaves the lungs? That's the question. If we can do that, there's no problem in measuring the air that leaves the lungs. We're doing that already for VCO2. Can we use that information to figure out what arterial CO2 and venous CO2 would be? Let's start with arterial CO2 this time. Oh, we, we started with arterial last time as well, but it was the first term. Let's jump all the way to the end, and let's try to figure out how would CO2 leaving the lungs be reflected in air in the lungs? How would we use the air that leaves the alveoli that's measured at the mouth to approximate CO2 on the arterial side? Is the air that leaves the lungs uh, representative of arterial CO2? Yes. Yeah, I'd agree with you. Why? Okay, good. So all of the blood in the body mixes. The lung sees the whole body sample of blood. And so you have the opportunity for whole body CO2 to somehow influence the air that's in the lungs. Whole body CO2, whole body O2. So this is the right place to measure it. Now what I want to know is what happens at the lungs that gives you confidence in saying, if I measure CO2 in the air in the lungs, that it's reflective of CO2 in the blood, in the arterial blood leaving the lungs. Gas exchange. Yes, absolutely. What about gas exchange? 
What does it have to be in order for the air that you measure in the, in the lungs to reflect arterial air? What gas exchange, but describe the gas exchange. What kind of or magnitude of gas exchange would you need at the lung? Okay. Good. One to one or complete was the idea that I was looking for. Complete gas exchange. One to one movement. You need any CO2 in the venous side to move into the lungs and assume that it reaches a balance. There's a one-to-one -one relationship. The arterial CO2 matches the alveolar CO2, and then it leaves the lungs and we measure it at the mouth. We need to assume complete exchange of gas. And think about it. If that works, CO2 is higher on the venous side because we've added it at the muscles. As soon as it reaches the alveoli, the lungs are set up for gas exchange. You know this from the first midterm, or from the only midterm. CO2 rushes out of the blood into the alveoli, and it does so according to the gradient that's established. There's lots in the blood, less in the air. Uh, CO2 will move accordingly. At some point, we're assuming that CO2 in the blood equals CO2 in the alveoli. And so there's no more movement. It's balanced in a one-to-one -one manner. And if it's balanced, and if you can measure CO2 in the alveoli, then you have a surrogate measure for CO2 in the arterial blood. Right? They've reached equilibrium. They're the same concentration. So if you can measure CO2 in the air of the alveoli, it has the same value as CO2 in the arterial blood. The question then is how we do that. Now, as soon as the air in the alveoli leaves, it uh, progresses through the respiratory zone, the conduction zone, out the mouth, and then, then we measure it. And generally, it's modified a little bit, and we'll talk about the, the nitty gritty details, but generally, CO2 leaving the alveoli has the same concentration as CO2 leaving in the arterial blood. So if you can measure that at the mouth, what we call end tidal CO2, you have a value that's representative of arterial CO2. Yeah, question? Yes, fantastic. Okay, so CO2 is buffered in the blood. Once it's unloaded, it's unbuffered, if that makes sense. So it won't be buffered in the air, and we're assuming with complete gas exchange that the buffering is only temporary. And so it is removed from that buffering system, it uh, is transferred into the air, and then it's still representative of arterial CO2 as it moves through the body. So there isn't a need to buffer CO2 because you've gotten rid of all the stuff that needed to be buffered with the gas exchange of the lungs. Does that make sense? Okay. Fantastic question, though. Really, uh, really nice way to loop that back in. So if you can measure the air as soon as this bolus gets to the mouth at the end of a breath, this is end tidal CO2, and measuring the percentage of CO2 in that air is reflective of arterial CO2. It's pretty easy to do, actually. End tidal CO2 you can set up as a column in the metabolic curve. What is more difficult is venous CO2. There's more carbon dioxide on the venous side than the arterial side. As soon as venous blood comes into contact with the alveoli, you can't do anything about it. It starts to exchange. There's movement across the membrane. You can't stop it. How would you ever get an unadulterated sample of what this high venous CO2 is? As soon as it rushes in, it's on a path towards equilibrium, and you can't stop it. 
This is where the rebreathe comes in. It's a relatively ingenious trick. If you don't allow CO2 to be removed from the system, it will build up. And it will build up in such a way that CO2 is deposited because there's a gradient. As more of it fills the alveoli, that gradient gets smaller, and at some point, it will accumulate in the air of the lungs where it matches the CO2 on the venous side. And as soon as that happens, there's no more uh, gas exchange. There's no more exchange of CO2, and it reaches a plateau. So if you could ever block the escape of CO2 from the lung system, you could watch the CO2 values plateau. And the point where it plateaus should be indicative of venous CO2 contents. So what I'm showing you here is we're going to close off this one alveolus alone. It will reach equilibrium quickly. Very small area for gas to move into and then stabilize. We can't do that. That's pretty invasive. But what we can do is what your parents always told you not to do as a kid. You put a plastic bag over your mouth. You breathe into it and out, and in, and out, and in, and out. You prevent the escape of CO2, and eventually it will fill the air in the lungs and reach a plateau. And that plateau will be representative of venous CO2 contents. With a block preventing the escape of CO2. If CO2 reaches an equilibrium, if it levels off in a plateau, then what you measure at the end of a breath as you expel the sample into the uh, metabolic cart will roughly equate to venous CO2 contents. This has the benefit of not being invasive. Although being somewhat uncomfortable, the whole procedure is relatively short. It might be 20 to 30 seconds breathing into a bag, and it's completely safe. Even though all the alarm bells go off because CO2 and the associated acidity are the prime drivers to ventilate, and all of a sudden they're building up in the body, and you're thinking, I don't want to do this. It's, it's a short 20 to 30 seconds breathing into a sealed plastic bag. This assumes that it reaches a plateau. And I just need to add this one quick ca uh, caveat before uh, we call it. Because this would work in theory if blood weren't moving. If you had venous CO2, it would reach an equilibrium that matched um, the CO2 in the venous blood. But because the heart is pumping and you're always adding CO2, not only does venous CO2 match alveolar CO2, but that equilibrium will pass over to the arterial side. Eventually, CO2 in the arterial blood leaving the lungs will also match venous CO2. And then that goes to the rest of the body. The muscles are still active. They're still depositing CO2. It circulates back to the heart, back to the lungs, hoping to uh, expel that CO2 by the lungs. And then at some point, especially at higher exercise when, when cardiac output is faster, venous CO2 will be artificially high. It's artificially high because we've trapped it. That CO2 has been sent out to the rest of the body. The body doesn't stop working. It adds extra CO2 like it normally would. And then the venous CO2 at the lungs is artificially higher than it would be in a normal non-rebreathing state. Hence why this measurement has to be quick. Not only because it's uncomfortable, but you don't want to measure recirculation. If you theoretically measured forever and then you passed out, you'd see this quick spike in CO2 that looked like it was starting to level off, but it never would because it would always recirculate and CO2 would build and build and build and build and build. We're never going to see a plateau. 
but we have an idea based on how it accumulates where that plateau would be. And that is the focus of next week's series of slides. How do we interpret the plateau? How do we calculate the plateau? Where do we get our numbers to plug into this equation to get cardiac outcome? All right, let's leave it there for today.